Look at the E's on the names of both of these batteries. Kind of weird. I'm glad I have the opportunity to compare these side by side and show you guys some of the things I found that are different in both the, the casings of the battery, what they offer in the kit, and see what the differences are inside too. This definitely looks different. I am so ready to open these up, but I know you guys are dying to see the differences in the cardboard boxes they came in, right? Well, I'm gonna show you anyways. Ha! Look how different they are. Oh, you can't tell the difference? Neither could I, especially since they shipped from the exact same address. I thought that was pretty funny. However, there is actually some differences here. The Vatra battery box is quite a bit thicker cardboard all around and larger corner protectors. Not by much, but still. Ooh, a little bit thicker cardboard. Look at this one. Took quite a beating on the edge there, and that's the thinner cardboard. To be fair to the Temgot, it arrived perfectly fine. In fact, all the scratches that you see on it was me messing around with trying to fit it in a golf cart. I might not be able to get it out again. Um, hmm. As of the filming of this video, the Temgot is a little bit cheaper than the Vatrer battery, or Vatrer, however you pronounce it. So starting from what's identical, they're both lithium iron phosphate, 16 cell, batteries. They claim 200 amps continuous discharge. A slight difference, this one says 400 amps for 35 seconds. This one says 315 amps for 30 seconds. I'm not sure I'm ever gonna see any of those amps with what I'm gonna use them for, but there you have the specs. <laughs> Come on, go! <laughs> Now we get into some of the differences here. This one weighs about 106 pounds, and this one was just at like 100 pounds. The Vatra is a little bit longer than the Temgot. That might be part of the weight increase on this guy over this one. Temgot, tiny, tiny bit taller. The width of the batteries, both at the casing and the lid, appear to be identical, no difference there. Inside each manual, they give you the actual dimensions. I also tried to convert them to inches for you. Hopefully you can read my handwriting. The Vature ships with these little rubber covers on the terminals just to keep you from accidentally bumping them. The Temgot, on the other hand, has these plastic ones that cover the terminals too, but you will be using these to put your cables through once you're done with the installation. Well, I just learned that with only three conductors, this plastic cover doesn't fit anymore. It's hitting the bolt right here, so it pops off really easily. The terminals on both batteries are M8 screws. So if you are in the US and you're buying lugs, you can get 5 16 That'll go on just perfectly on either battery. These terminals stick out a little bit further on the Vatra than on the Temgot. Bluetooth antennas poking out, vents on both batteries to deal with temperature fluctuations. As for monitoring, Temgot comes with this little guy and the Vatra comes with this guy. And then on the Temgot, this actually is an external battery switch. So you can turn it on if you mount this remotely. Some differences here, you get a little bit more information. The Vatra has the option to go in and see some other pages here. Page three actually gives you all the voltages from every cell. And this one is just a very basic, no touch screen, no buttons. But I think both batteries have Bluetooth apps that allow you to see the same thing. These are the rubber boots we'll use on the Vatra. The LCD screen didn't come with any hardware to mount it to your golf cart. Not real concerned about that. The Temgot, on the other hand, comes with some hardware. Either drill a hole in your golf cart or if you want a little display, little stand bracket to mount it on top of something like your dash or whatever. The manuals are basically identical. All the spelling errors are the same. Here, the information is in slightly different places. The Vature battery gives you a little bit more material to look over. This is all the information on the charger. So you can kind of check out the specs if you need to see those. Not much on here, to be honest. And then you do get a very basic wiring diagram, but it's going to depend a lot on your golf cart, how to hook it up. So this charger is rated for 58.4 volts and 20 amps. This one's rated for 56.8 volts and 18 amps. All the fasteners are stainless steel, and this is an aluminum plate. On the Temgot, you have a steel guard, steel screws, casing is still cast aluminum. The backside, steel screws, and a steel plate versus stainless steel screws and what looks like another aluminum plate. There's a screw missing in this one. Not sure where that ended up. Cables are actually a little bit different too. The Vatra one is a little bit bigger um, and a slightly different style. Similar story on the DC side, 3.5 millimeters squared, somewhere between 12 and 11 gauge. 
Hem got 2.5 millimeters squared, somewhere around a 13 gauge, I believe. The plugs are a bit different. The Vatra one is kind of a quick disconnect. Push in and it clicks and it won't come back out unless you twist this and then undo it. The Temgat one, it's just screwed on. You can definitely feel they're a little bit thinner conductors. These seem to be sealed, like molded. One thing I found when I was opening up the package is these connectors are not fully tightened down. Even the inside barrel here, you can grab it and, and turn the, the whole outside just by hand here. Look at this one. This rubber grommet here can't grab onto the cable properly to seal it up. It was cut too far back, basically. Double check your connections. Charging up the Temgat. It's been going for about an hour or so. A little bit of warmth in this connector at 113 Fahrenheit. Cables at 112. Chargers right around 116, almost 130. 125 degrees to 130. It's kind of funny how the sticker is warm because it's not radiating as much heat as the aluminum plate. I just find that cool. I mean, hot. DC output side is around 123. Connector. Yeah, not much delta there, about two to three degrees. Again, the cable, it's only two to three degrees above ambient. Let's see what's inside. Ooh, this looks nice. All these bus bars across the cell terminals are, looks like laser welded. Bus bar to join the two different packs. A little bit flexible with a, a bit of a strain relief in there. Looks like all the terminals are kind of marked with some like waxy looking goop to indicate that they have been torqued down to spec. That's good to see. I don't see any soldered connections. The little tabs for all the balance leads and temperature sensors are not only riveted, but the tab itself is laser welded onto the bus bar below it. So I like the combination there. I think that's a good design for a battery that's gonna be in a high vibration environment. They appear tight enough. They're not like wiggling or anything, which is good. Everything is nicely wrapped in this like almost electrical tape, but it's kind of like abrasion resistant and everything's cable tied in multiple spots down to this top board, whatever's laying on top of the cells, like a foam layer. And then on top of that is kind of a hard but semi-flexible plastic. You can see I can mark it with the pencil there. Unfortunately, it means I can't actually see any QR codes that should be laser etched to the top of the cells. There is a date, serial number, and tiny QR code on the side of the batteries. I can see four of them here. To be perfectly honest, I don't even know where to look up QR codes to find out if they're official. So all in all, this looks really nice. And you see they're underneath the balance leads is what looks like the top vent for the cells. You can see it like flex there. It's like a membrane. If this cell had a thermal runaway, this would burst and gases would come out the top there. Unlikely to happen, but if it happens, they would vent upwards. I don't see any anywhere that wires are going to chafe. I don't see anything that's loose. It looks like on either side of the eight cell modules, are these cast aluminum frames here with these threaded screws all the way down. And you've got this little stamp steel kind of frame that it screws into, which gives the bottom of the pack a bit of rigidity and supports the cells and also gives you the spot to thread into. And then you have these straps that run around each module of batteries to hold it in under a little bit of compression for when the cells are charging and discharging. You can even see behind this cast aluminum piece, it's not directly contacting the cell, which is wrapped in the blue. It's got this like sticky, some type of little insulation and uh, abrasion resistance thing that sits there. So that's important because if the cells are expanding and contracting even a little bit, it's going to rub on the cast aluminum here. And in this case, it's got some extra abrasion resistance. All cells are in series here, so everything adds up to about 51.2 volts between here and here. And then the BMS, which is down in here, is what's disconnecting the negative from outputting if the battery switches off. At least that's in theory. I don't think it physically disconnects, but let's look. It's really hard to see the BMS down in here. I'll try and get a good shot. There's your vent right here. 
This is where your, your plug goes for the battery state of charge monitor. This is of course the power switch mounted on the casing. There's your Bluetooth wire here. Oh, I should mention the underside of the lid here is an insulator and this should prevent any of the components down here shorting out with the lid of the battery. Well, that's about all I can think of looking at this. And I think you all have waited long enough. Let's get this one open. Whoa. Before I dive in, similar kind of hard plastic material on top. This definitely looks different. Starting from what I can see, laser welded uh, bus bars. However, each module here has its own, almost looks like a flexible printed circuit board. All the balance leads are part of this printed circuit board. And then I can see there's little laser welding to laser weld the, the balance leads onto each bus bar, which is encased in the flexible circuit board thing itself. I'm gonna guess that's what this means here. Flexible printed circuit assembly. This is cool. This is very interesting. All the balance leads and looks like also temperature leads from the BMS come up into this single connector and then they're broken out into this, all these traces here on the kind of flexible circuit assembly. And then you've got the tabs for each bus bar here, laser welded onto the bus bar. And then this one appears like it's sharing the balance lead and the temperature sensor on the same little tab here. So you see the B1 slash T1. So it's the balance one and temperature one sensor. So that's super cool. And then just seeing the cutouts for where the laser welds go is cool too. Cause this is all like adhered onto the bus bar. The bus bar is basically encapsulated in this material. It's interesting to see all these little holes here through the bus bar and flexible material in different spots. So you probably lay this thing down then put the bus bars on and there's like pins or something that come through to help you locate everything in the proper spot. And then you lay the top layer on and it's probably all compressed and then heated together. One thing I noticed here is, do you see kind of these little white marks like that one up there? It's actually splatter from the welds. It might just be the robot needs a little bit of calibration or maybe this is just normal and that always happens. I don't actually know. I'm not familiar with laser welding. We're looking very similar to the Temgot here. However, this bus bar is solid. So there's no flex in this. And there's also no bend or anything. I don't expect it to be heating up too much, but if it does, uh, it would want to expand, push away from itself. It would be nice to see maybe a little bit of an expansion joint there to allow that without these terminals getting loosened or worked too much. The other difference from the Temgot is instead of cast aluminum that hold the batteries in, these are extruded aluminum, but they're doing the exact same job. Over on the Temgot here, you've got this little slot section, and that's to accept these terminal blocks here. They just make this cast piece symmetrical so that no matter which side they're putting this on, they can do that. And same thing on this one over here. Come over to the Vatra, and you've got similar setup there, except it's a slot cut out in the extruded aluminum channel. And it doesn't appear that they do it symmetrical. I think they cut it specifically for the section it's going to go into. Quick little side note, I didn't know how these flexible copper bus bars were done, but it looks like you have this tab here is solid, so it's likely like kind of welded together, but then it transitions to just these tiny little thin sheets of copper, so you can actually have it be flexed and bent and everything without like a whole lot of trouble that you would have if this was a solid copper bus bar. I think it's just kind of fascinating. One thing I wanted to point out, so rather than just these extruded aluminum pieces you see here, those pieces are bolted to the bottom of the battery, but also you've got this entire casing here and you can see it actually goes all the way around the battery. And yeah, maybe you can see a little better here. You've got this gray steel piece going all the way down to the bottom and it goes all the way around, kind of inner casing around all the cells. And then the BMS is bolted to that casing too. So the negative cable coming in here goes through this kind of flexible copper bus bar down to the BMS, which it looks like there's actually a relay or contactor to disconnect this completely. Outside of that contactor or relay, 
it goes to this copper bus bar here where there's another semi-flexible copper bus bar coming up to the battery terminal. I'm really interested to see in how all this stuff is done here. Here's where I was a little confused. You know, I see these temperature sensors here, but I don't see any wires here. And it turns out they are not wired up. T1 is right here. So let's see if I can even get it to warm up with my finger here. Okay, I'm seeing a change in T4 there most prominently, but it seems like T1 is showing exactly the same. So maybe T1, the little max symbol next to it, is just telling you which one is max out of the temperature sensors available. That is definitely wired in to the BMS, okay? I'm seeing T3 climbing up, and now that one is showing as the max temperature, okay? So that one's confirmed to be working. Over here in the back, let me try that. I'm not seeing anything rise. We're still seeing the, the second temperature sensor I tested dropping. Okay, let's try this one here, the T4. Now I don't recommend putting your fingers inside of any battery, so don't do this at home. Okay, I'm not seeing any rise in temperature on T4 either. I can't see anything on the BMS, but I'm gonna use a little hair dryer and see what we get. Okay, I'm seeing T2 increase. So I would ignore the, the labels, it's not actually lining up with what's on the system, but it does appear that there is a third temperature sensor. There's at least three in total. Let that cool down and let's move on to the Temgot battery. Now on the Temgot, we've got T1 here, T2 there, T3, T4, T5, and T6. So if this is correct, there are six temperature sensors on the top of the battery module. Kind of crazy. On the Temgot app, I'm only seeing four temperature sensors. I'm gonna try the Vatra because I think I saw more there. Yeah, look at that, we're showing eight. So really, there should be six readable temperature sensors on here if T1 and T8 is actually just uh, max and minimum, respectively. We'll start with T1 here. Looks like T2 is increasing. Let's try T2 on the battery. Yep, there we go, yep. Yep, I'm not seeing any movement here with my T5 temperature sensor. All right, I'm gonna try the last one here on top, T6. Definitely not seeing anything moving here. Let's move on to the hairdryer. Okay, so there's at least a temperature sensor on the BMS, that's good. So two extra temperature sensors in the Temga, at least as far as I can tell with the tools that I have available to me. I really like seeing this stuff side by side. Functionally, they do the exact same thing. The BMSs claim 200 amps of output. You can tell this BMS in the Vature has some type of a switch to disconnect the negative. The Temgot only would be an electronic cutoff switch. So that gives you kind of a little bit of reason why the Vature is a longer casing plus the steel casing around the battery modules. They're just doing it in little different ways. And I like seeing this flexible printed circuit assembly just because it's an interesting idea when you think about manufacturing. There's no reason this doesn't work. It's just this might be simpler for, for manufacturing reasons. Maybe they don't need a, a person to, to sit there and, and like try and get all these little balance leads set up with the rivet gun. Maybe it's just take this, plop it on the cells, and the robot laser welds it all. I like that kind of stuff. I think it's time to get them in the golf cart one at a time nope. and test everything out. I can hear you guys asking the question, so I'm gonna find out for you. 